I'm Michael Thorpe. I'm uh, from uh, New York, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, tiredness and sleepiness. And uh, you may think that this is sort of the opposite of insomnia, and in some ways it is, but uh, the two can go together. There are many patients who um, have insomnia who are tired, fatigued, sleepy during the daytime. And then there are people who have disorders such as narcolepsy, which I'm going to be talking to you about, which uh, presents because of insomnia. Some people think they have insomnia, and uh, seen a number of patients that have been to their physicians complaining about insomnia. And it's turned out that they've actually had narcolepsy because they felt that their tiredness and fatigue was due to not sleeping well at night. And Disturbed sleep at night happens to be a part of narcolepsy. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about narcolepsy, about its diagnosis, about uh, what causes it, and then I'm going to talk about treatment. The main focus uh, I've been asked to talk to you about is really about treatment, so I'm going to focus more on that aspect of it. But uh, let's talk about narcolepsy. What is narcolepsy? I mean, most people think narcolepsy is a rare disorder. You know, unlikely that uh, you have narcolepsy because you're tired, fatigued, but it's not narcolepsy. You don't fall asleep suddenly, unexpectedly. <coughs> well, it turns out that of people who are complaining about being tired and sleepy during the daytime, about 5% turn out to have narcolepsy. It's like really quite a high number. So it's not really that rare. <coughs> People with narcolepsy have sleepiness, but the sleepiness can vary enormously. It's not always sudden, severe falling asleep, as some people think. There's a term sleep attacks that's often used. Not all patients with narcolepsy have sleep attacks. There are different types of sleepiness that occur in narcolepsy. There's a background level of tiredness and fatigue that's there all the time never goes away. <clears throat> no matter what the person does, if they go on vacation for several weeks and sleep a lot, there's this tiredness and fatigue that's always there. And there are many patients who have that as their main symptom and they think, oh, I could never have narcolepsy. And yet it takes years for most patients for narcolepsy to get a diagnosis because people don't think gee, maybe this background level of tiredness and fatigue is narcolepsy. Maybe I should see my physician and find out, do I really have something that's going on? Now, people with narcolepsy also tend to take, uh, have sleep episodes more frequently. So they may nap more often. Take naps often, even before midday. They may get up in the morning and feel sleepy and take a nap before midday. They may have naps in the afternoon. <coughs> In severest forms, they will suddenly fall asleep when they're doing something, maybe at their desk doing something and fall asleep. Severest patients with narcolepsy can actually fall asleep while walking. So sleepiness is a major factor of narcolepsy. There's another form of sleepiness that can occur in patients with narcolepsy. It's called automatic behavior. What happens is, and some of you may have experienced this, you do something, and then you have no memory for doing it afterwards. So, for example, you may cross a bridge, you may pay a toll, you may go somewhere, and you get to where you're going, and you think, gee, I don't remember crossing that bridge, but I obviously did it. So people are doing things normally, but they have no memory for the process. And that's because sleep can produce what we call micro-sleep episodes little one to two second episodes of sleep while you're awake and functioning. And those little episodes of sleep blot out memory formation. So people can uh, not have uh, recent uh, memory for events. <coughs> so there's many different types of sleepiness that occur in narcolepsy. There's background level, falling asleep voluntarily, taking naps, involuntary falling asleep, and then these little micro-sleep episodes while the person's actually awake, what I call wake sleepiness. So being tired, fatigued, sleepy is the main feature of narcolepsy. 
And then there's a, another symptom that's often talked about. It's called cataplexy, emotionally induced muscle weakness, where people will get emotional about something and get some weakness. And patients who have it severely, they actually get it not just with emotion. They can get what we call spontaneous episodes. It may just be doing something, maybe exercise while they're exercising, or just interacting with people, and there may not be much emotion with it, but they get a feeling of weakness. <clears throat> In the worst forms, people will fall to the ground, and that's what we most often talk about with regards to cataplexy, but it may not be like that. I'm mean, sure everybody in this room has experienced it. Sometime, if you get really excited about something, you get a feeling of weakness. You're laughing like mad, and you sort of go down like this. That's really sort of like a partial manifestation of cataplexy. It's normal. But in people with narcolepsy, it becomes more pronounced. And very often, it may not just be the legs. It may be the face, maybe the upper part of the body. And typically, these people, what they'll do is that they may hear something a little emotional, and their head will come down. Their eyes may come down a little bit. Their face sort of flattens because they lose muscle activity in the face. They may be talking and their voice may slur a little bit. They may be holding something and, and think about something a little emotional and they tend to get a little weakness and drop something. So this is a, a unusual symptom. It's called a pathognomonic symptom because it only occurs in narcolepsy. And it's called cataplexy. So there's weakness with some type of <coughs> emotion. <coughs> now, often in narcolepsy, people talk about sleepiness and cataplexy. But narcolepsy is more than that. You know, I, I get a little upset when people just think, well, you either have sleepiness or you have cataplexy, and therefore you have narcolepsy. But narcolepsy is really more than that. What happens in narcolepsy is that we get sleep that is totally disrupted. And the main component of that disruption that produces symptoms is the dreaming sleep or REM sleep. And people with narcolepsy have disrupted REM sleep. And this cataplexy is actually a partial manifestation of this dreaming sleep. When we go into dreaming sleep, our body becomes what we call atonic. We lose muscle tone. And we have a weakness, but usually we're in bed, so it doesn't make any difference. But if you're standing and you get some partial manifestation, then you get the weakness in the limbs. But people can also have a lot of dreams while they're awake. So they have a partial manifestation of this REM sleep while they're awake. And they can have episodes of uh, uh, <coughs> being unable to move when they awaken in the morning because they wake out of dreaming sleep. But there's still a little bit of that dreaming sleep occurring, and therefore they try to get out of bed and they can't move. It's called sleep paralysis. So there are a number of different manifestations of this disrupted REM sleep that occur in narcoleptics. So narcolepsy is more than just sleepiness and cataplexy. It actually can affect other components, and it's a 24-hour day problem. Now, typically, patients with narcolepsy have disturbed sleep at night, and that's where Sometimes patients have presented because they think they have insomnia because they can't sleep well at night. And they think the fatigue and tiredness is all due to their inability to sleep at night. So disturbed sleep at night is a typical feature in narcolepsy. Sleepiness during the day is a typical feature. So there's disruption of the sleep-wake process for the whole 24 hours. <coughs> Now, because they have this disrupted dreaming sleep, we use that to help us to diagnose narcolepsy. And the diagnosis of narcolepsy involves sleep tests. You need an overnight sleep study. You need a daytime test called a multiple sleep latency test. What that means is five nap opportunities at two hourly intervals during the day. And when we do that, we look for two things during the daytime. We look at how quickly people fall asleep. The actual diagnostic criteria are if a person on average falls asleep in less than eight minutes, that's consistent with narcolepsy. We also look at whether there are any components of this disrupted dreaming sleep occurring during the day. 
And when they have these nap opportunities during the day, if they go into this dreaming sleep, that's unusual. Normal people or healthy people will, may do it once during the day, but patients with narcolepsy will do it multiple times, sometimes as many as five times during every nap during the day, they'll go into the dreaming sleep. That's very abnormal. But twice is particularly indicative of narcolepsy. So two or more times of this dreaming sleep during the day helps make the diagnosis of narcolepsy. <clears throat> now I mentioned it takes a, a long time for people to get a diagnosis of narcolepsy. They typically see many physicians because of tiredness and fatigue before they get referred to a sleep doctor and undergo this type of testing to show that they do have narcolepsy. So on average, it takes between 8 and 12 years for people to get a diagnosis of narcolepsy. Far too long. Typically, it tends to occur in children. The median age of onset is 16 years. So half the children, half the patients with narcolepsy, it occurs before age 16. And it occurs equally in males and females. So what is narcolepsy? What causes narcolepsy? Well, we've learned a lot in the last few years. And what we believe now is that narcolepsy is an autoimmune disorder that affects the brain. And it affects particular cells in the brain, in the part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And it affects cells that produce a neuropeptide called erexin, or it's also got another name, hypocretin cells. And these get destroyed in this autoimmune response. So basically what it means is that the body is attacking itself and it's destroying its own cells. Well, what causes that? What causes the body to attack its own cells? Well, all the evidence tends to suggest it's most likely due to some form of infection. Data showing that streptococcus has been associated, streptococcal infections. Viruses, such as the H1N1 virus, has been associated with producing narcolepsy. There are also case reports of people with infectious mononucleosis, Lyme's disease. So almost any type of an infective agent seems to be able to precipitate narcolepsy. It's also shown in Europe that actually vaccines could produce narcolepsy. In Europe, they used a particular vaccine against the H1N1 virus, and they showed that there was a, an increase in cases of narcolepsy. And so the World Health Organization has investigated this thoroughly and uh, uh, <coughs> believe that uh, this is a uh, significant cause. It didn't, didn't happen in uh, the United States or in Canada because that particular vaccine wasn't used here. It was used in Europe, Pandemrix it was called. So uh, infections, rarely a vaccine, such as this H1N1 vaccine, can cause narcolepsy. <coughs> we can measure the loss of this peptide, and, but it involves a spinal tap. Most people don't want a spinal tap, right, because it causes uh, some morbidity associated with it, which means it can cause some side effects, chronic headache, for example. But if you were to do a spinal tap in people that have severe narcolepsy, you would find that this neuropeptide, hypocretin, is not present, it's absent, or very, very low in amounts. So that can be another way of diagnosing narcolepsy. It can be an alternative to doing those sleep tests. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's not easy to get that measurement for that neuropeptide, so not everybody has availability to be able to get that measured. Okay, so there are some patients who have a slightly different form of narcolepsy, <coughs> and it doesn't have that cataplexy. I mentioned that weakness with emotion. They don't have that. So we recognize there are two type, major types of narcolepsy, one with the emotionally induced muscle weakness and another without it. If you've got the emotionally induced muscle weakness, the weakness when somebody laughs, 
then that makes it relatively easy to make it a clinical diagnosis of narcolepsy. If you don't have that, it's more difficult because all you have is sleepiness. Somebody's just sleepy during the day. That's where we need those sleep tests to be able to look at and see do they have this ability to go into the dreaming sleep during the day and if they have that, then we can make the diagnosis. <coughs> Okay, so let me change and now talk about treatment. Now, the main symptom for most patients with narcolepsy is this tiredness, fatigue, and sleepiness. And the treatment for that is by medications. Traditionally, in the past, the only medications that were available were what we call traditional stimulants, methylphenidate, amphetamines. And we still use those, although their use is getting less and less. And the reason is because we have a lot more treatment options for people with narcolepsy now than we had in the past. And those drugs, amphetamines, methylphenidate, are associated with bad adverse effects. They can cause heart problems, mental stimulation, even psychosis in some people. And they can be habit forming. And the dose can increase to high levels because people become almost addicted to it. Although addiction is pretty uncommon in people with narcolepsy. So we prefer not to use the traditional stimulants if we can avoid it. Fortunately, we have new drugs that have been approved in the last few decades. One of the most common drugs is a drug called modafinil also known as Provigil, and there's another drug called uh, Armadafinil, which is a variation of it called Nuvigil. These are two of the commonest drugs used for improving wakefulness in people with narcolepsy. And they're very effective and have a lower potential for side effects compared with the other drugs. The two main adverse effects of these drugs tend to be that, one, they can interfere with oral contraceptive agents. So any women that are on oral contraceptives needs to use some other form of contraception because it'll reduce the efficacy of oral contraceptives. So that's one negative thing about the modafinils. They also very rarely can cause uh, rashes. Some of those rashes may be very bad, but that's not very common. But it is a concern if a patient develops a major rash, can, which can almost be life-threatening in some cases. Other than that, the modafinils are pretty well tolerated. And most patients tend to use them, but they only produce improvement in the sleepiness. They don't help the cataplexy, that weakness. Sometimes, as I mentioned, the weakness can be so severe, patients can have lots and lots of episodes during the day and can fall to the ground, really can't do much in the way of uh, general sort of activities because they keep getting weak all the time. And that's where we have other medications. In the past, we used to use drugs that Dr. Uh, uh, Moran talked about before, antidepressants, because certain activities of those antidepressants are not treating depression in narcolepsy, they're treating the uh, narcolepsy features. They alter the neurotransmitters that are involved in narcolepsy. And there's one particular group of antidepressants called norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors that are particularly effective at stopping cataplexy. So we tended to use the antidepressants to stop that symptom of cataplexy. Doesn't do much for the sleepiness during the day. And the drugs like modafinil, they don't do anything for the cataplexy. So you often need to use two drugs together. However, we have newer drugs that have become available. And it's really a very exciting time in narcolepsy because there are a whole host of new drugs that are potentially going to be coming available and some that have just been approved. There are two drugs that have just been approved in the United States for the treatment of narcolepsy. One other drug that's been used for a number of years, was first approved in 2002, is sodium oxabate called Xyrem. 
Xyrem is a very effective agent for narcolepsy. It treats the sleepiness, treats the cataplexy, and it has other advantages too. In those patients who have disturbed sleep at night, it can help that. And it can help uh, prevent some of the abnormal dreaming phenomena such as a sleep paralysis and hypnagogic hallucination since it really it's the only drug that treats all the features of narcolepsy. Sodium oxabate. Sodium oxabate though is a drug that comes from a really bad background. It's a sodium salt of gamma hydroxybutyrate. It was actually uh, first used for narcolepsy here in Canada many years ago. And, uh, but gamma hydroxybutyrate was a drug that used to be abused. Not so much now, but it used to be abused a lot. It was also called the date rape drug because it was uh, odorless and colorless and if you put it in an uh, alcoholic drink and somebody drinks it, it, it makes them fall asleep very quickly. So that's why it's called a date rape drug. So it got a lot of bad publicity, but this drug Xyrem is now available and comes from uh, uh, specialized pharmacies. And it's a very, very effective, probably the most effective drug we have for narcolepsy. As they say, it treats, it's the only drug that treats all the symptoms of narcolepsy. So it's, it's widely used. Now, I mentioned that there are some new medications that have just become available. One of them is called Solreamphetol, or Wakex. And this drug was only just approved in March. It's a drug that um, is very effective at improving sleepiness during the day. And it also has an effect on cataplexy, although in the United States it wasn't FDA approved for cataplexy just for sleepiness, but the studies that have been done have shown that it can be effective for cataplexy as well as sleepiness. And the good thing about it is, whereas a lot of the other drugs are scheduled drugs, that just means that they have the potential for habit forming. This drug, uh, Wakex, is not. It's not scheduled, so it's an unscheduled medication. And it works in a quite a different way to all the other drugs in narcolepsy. It affects a system called the histamine system in the brain. And histamine is an important neurotransmitter that increases our level of arousal. And so it helps to increase that uh, histamine level in the brain, waking us up. But also that helps with the cataplexy as well. So it's a new drug that's available. <clears throat> it's often used in combination with other drugs, or can, although it can be used as a first-line drug by itself. It can be used for both people who have sleepiness, or if people have got sleepiness and cataplexy, it can be used in those patients and may be effective for both symptoms. Or it can be added on to other drugs. So if somebody's on, for example, sodium oxabate, we can add patolicin to get additional improvement. See, there's something about uh, narcolepsy that's important. We can use medications to help patients with narcolepsy, but we can't make them normal again. You cannot eliminate that drive for sleep and that altered REM pressure in patients with narcolepsy. We can help it a lot. There are some patients who get dramatic improvements with our medications, but for the majority of patients, even with the best treatments we have, there's still some feeling of tiredness, fatigue, or sleepiness there. In most cases, we can control that muscle weakness, the cataplexy, better than we can control the sleepiness. So for many patients, we can stop cataplexy completely now with the drugs. But for most patients, we can't eliminate entirely the tendency for sleepiness. There's an interesting thing that happens with a number of these drugs, and that is that many of these drugs that improve wakefulness and, and helps deal with the sleepiness, they improve people's ability to remain awake, but they don't get rid of that underlying pressure for sleep. So 
Amphetamines, for example, many patients who take them, they find they can do things better, but there's always this background feeling of sleepiness that's there. Now, in addition to, uh, so that's hard to eliminate, and that's why most patients with narcolepsy still have some symptoms despite the best treatment. The other new treatment is a drug called uh, solreamphetol or Sinosi which is sort of like modafinils, but probably has a better safety profile, maybe more efficacious. That's recently approved and is uh, now a, uh, uh, just beginning to be av made available to the general public. And it's gonna play a big part in the role of uh, narcolepsy. For the future, we're hoping that drugs will replace that neuropeptide that I said was destroyed, the hypocretin. And there are studies that are about to start in the United States looking at drugs that can actually help to replace that hypocretin or orexin, and those are eagerly sought after. They should make a big difference to the treatment. Okay, so I'm gonna stop at this point so that we have a few minutes for questions, because I'm sure some of you have some questions about treatment, I'm happy to answer them. Has anyone uh, got any questions about, it? about uh, medications to improve alertness or treat narcolepsy.